Hello everybody and welcome to the second episode of my creative process. Today we are going to take a look at Silas Wilby's workflow. He is a professional um, video creator and uh, a freelance uh, filmmaker and he also has a YouTube channel with over two and a half K subscribers. So Silas, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Uh, hi Vince, thanks for having me. Um, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. No problem. Uh, thank you for coming to the show. Uh, okay, so first of all, I want to ask you uh, the same questions that I did with Paul. Um, how much do you think gear matters in uh, a YouTube channel's uh, career and also in like filmmaking? Because uh, if you're working with clients, it's pretty important to have good quality. But uh, how important do you think it actually is? Um, well, I think for client jobs especially, it's nice to have good gear, but you can always rent it if you don't have it, if they're paying you enough, obviously. Yeah. So I think for freelance kind of jobs, it's really important to have, you know, at least HD gear and no cheap Canon, like, T3i or something like that. you got to have something a little better than that. But for a YouTube channel, I mean, you could get by on your phone. Your new, If you have any of the new Androids, iPhones nowadays, it, it'll work just fine for you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, do you actually have your own gear or do you always rent it with uh, freelance jobs? Uh, and if you have some gear, then could you tell me what uh, lenses do you use, what microphone do you use, camera, etc.? Yes, uh, I do own most of my own gear. I generally just use that. Although occasionally for bigger projects, I might rent some things if I don't have the exact right tool. But uh, I use my Panasonic Lumix G7, which is like, you have the G85, so it's like the little brother almost. Yeah. Shoots a nice 4K image at a high bit rate. And it has an okay slow motion. I do use the 60 FPS for all kinds of like events, especially, is you're gonna want at least 60 FPS to have an HD. So it's nice to have that. For lenses, I my favorite lens is my Panasonic uh, 25 millimeter F1.7, because on a micro four thirds, that's about a 50 millimeter full frame equivalent. Yeah. And it's just the most beautiful focal length. I also use my Rokinine 85mm T1.5 quite a bit and the Panasonic 14mm F1 2.8 I think. Those would be my three my three go-to lenses. Okay cool. I'm actually shooting this uh, here uh, video with the Lumix 25mm 1.7 and it's absolutely gorgeous so yep, yeah too. it's a very good bang for your buck I think. I've actually made a video on that so if you want to check it out then make sure to do so. Uh, anyways, uh, what microphone do you use? Because you didn't talk about that, I think, uh, and I think it's very important in filmmaking to have crispy audio, so what do you use? I use the uh, Rode video mic, it's like right up here, just out of frame, I'll pull it in if you guys want to yeah. see, but uh, I use the Rode video mic, plain old normal video mic, not the Pro, not the Go, um, for most of my videos, but I also use the NTG3 from Rode every now and then, because it's just a little bit better. And then for most of my videos, I'm using the Zoom H1 to record my audio, but again, I'll use the Zoom H4n when I'm using the NTG3 because there's no XLR on the H1. Oh, cool. Do you own the uh, NTG3? Because I think it's a very, very good microphone. That's what uh, Mari Hapoya uses as well. It, so it, it's uh, super high quality. It certainly gives you I'm some nice audio. Right. I don't own it though because it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a 100... Uh, no, well, no, it's sorry, it's one thousand bucks. So it's a yeah, super it's expensive very expensive. Mic. Yeah, but it's you can rent it for I think eighty bucks for like four days, so it's not bad that way. In my country, it's actually uh, very expensive to rent stuff, so that's why I uh, buy most of my equipment because it just wouldn't worth it to me to to you know rent stuff. But uh, yeah, anyways. Yeah, I like to buy as much equipment as I can. So like, I mean, sometimes I'll do jobs just, and I know I need one piece of gear and they'll pay totally like just enough to buy that piece of gear. So sometimes I'll do jobs just for the new piece of gear I want, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. uh, a, a long time ago I did a job just for like, they needed a zoomed in, they needed some zoomed in coverage of this uh, sporting event and I didn't have enough of a zoom lens. I was using the kit lens at that time. So that was my actual second lens was my Rokinine 85mm. Kind of regret it now because I really don't use it all that often. But it was I was super excited to have like a big lens with a red ring on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like a Canon as serious glass. <laughs> yeah, and then you were asking okay. about drone. I use the DJI Mavic Air, but I've also had a DJI Phantom and a GoPro Karma before. 
you can kind of see the Mavic Air right back there behind me. Um, uh, yeah, behind me is the Mavic Pro right there. Uh, and actually, it's ridiculous that they just put out, uh, I mean, not right, not uh, really lately, but they actually announced, you know, the Mavic Air and it shoots uh, 100 megabit per second uh, 4K, which looks so much better than the 60 on the Mavic Pro because uh, in the Mavic, with the Mavic, you get a lot of grain in the shadows, yeah. which kind of sucks, but uh, whatever, I think it still shoots amazing uh, videos, so... That's why, that's why I went with the matter. Mavic Air over the Mavic Pro is because of the high bit rate. Because, like, I mean, if you look at my channel, a lot of the times when I shoot my drone is at golden hour, sunset, sunrise kind of times. So there's lots of contrast going on, and the 60 megabytes a second just wouldn't cut it. Yeah. And uh, what do you edit with? Because uh, I think, I think uh, in filmmaking, editing uh, plays a huge role. So for, you know, banger films, you have to uh, have a good program, and you also have to know how to use it. So... What do you use with, for that? I use the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite, everything, Photoshop, Lightroom, Premiere, After Effects. But for most of the compositing I do, I actually use HitFilm Pro just because I don't like After Effects for some reason. And then I'll use mm -hmm. DaVinci Resolve for a lot of my high-end color grading when Premiere just won't cut it. I probably spend about 50% of my editing, 50 to 75% just inside of Premiere because, I mean, it's Premiere and it's way better than Final Cut. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I kind of have to disagree and agree with you at the same time, because like, uh, now I switched to Final Cut. Uh, I know you did, that's for... why. Yeah, because like, uh, I wasn't really okay with the paying fees of uh, Adobe, because like, that's true. In, hu in Hungary, it's much more expensive than in the US, because here I have to pay uh, like $70 a month for all the apps, and I would Ouch. use pretty much all of them. Uh, and you know that adds up mo month by month, so yeah. that would be like eight hundred um eight hundred bucks a year which which just wouldn't be worth it for me and I was like, okay, I'm gonna spend like four hundred bucks on uh you know final cut uh because I can do most of the things that I want to do inside that program yeah uh, but i just I just didn't have the money to spend that much on Adobe apps, but I agree with that uh, they are much more advanced. On the side of uh, Final Cut, I think that they run so much faster. That's like, true. Like, I have a Mac now, and uh, it's just blazing fast, and I love it that I don't even have to turn on uh, background rendering, and it's just super fast. It always saves my projects, so I never have that problem where it crashes and I lose everything. Uh, so, yeah, I actually like it a lot. Yeah, I Premiere does run very slowly on my computer, and I have... Uh, less than superb uh, computer setup, mm -hmm. but I that's just really expensive. I can't believe how much that costs for the Creative Cloud there. Did you ever try the student yeah. rate? Because I was there is get... no student uh, program here, so that Ugh. that sucks as well. Because I'm able to get it for the entire Creative Cloud for twenty bucks a month on the student rate, just because I'm a student age, even though I'm not actually like mm -hmm. going to any using it for any school. Yeah, but there is no student program, so I couldn't even sign up for that here. So, yeah, whatever. Uh, what do you think was your best investment so far in terms of gear? Well, it'd either be the G7, because before that I had a Nikon D3300, which was 1080p, didn't have a touchscreen LCD, didn't have a sharp image at all, had lousy performance, much softer image, which when everything's softer, you're able to make more mistakes without realizing it. So yeah. when I got the higher quality camera, I started no noticing how many mistakes I was making. And when you realize what you're doing, you can fix it. So it was either the G7 or the Adobe Creative Cloud, because I've just learned so much more from editing since I switched from HitFilm Pro over to the Adobe Creative Cloud for most of my editing. Mm -hmm. uh, was HitFilm Pro your first editing uh, program that you ever used? I actually used HitFilm Express before because it was free. But I did end up with HitFilm... Okay, my watch just beeped. But I did end up with HitFilm Pro because it was a lot more powerful than HitFilm Express. And at the time, I thought it did everything. But that was before I'd ever used Premiere. And then I used Premiere and I realized how uh, lacking HitFilm Pro was. I see. I I have been through a lot of editing programs, actually. Because I started with Camtasia Studio. I don't know how to I've used that before, that, too, but... actually. Yeah, and then I used uh, Sony Vegas. And then I used uh, Premiere Pro, and now I'm using Final Cut. So 
yeah, it's a long history of editing programs. Anyways, uh, I have a, a like kind of a fun question for you. If you had uh, five thousand dollars in your um, in your pocket and you would go to a camera shop, what would be the five items that you would pick up from those uh, dollars? Is this um, American prices or Hungarian prices here? Amer American prices. Okay, yeah. then I would probably pick up the GH5. Either that or the Solid. A7S3, but I think we, when it comes out. But I think because I already have all the Micro Four Thirds lenses, I'd go with the GH5. And then uh, DJI Ronin M, because I like the full-size gimbals. They're just so much smoother. I've used the handheld ones. I've used the full-size ones. The full-size ones are a lot smoother. Mm -hmm. And then I'm you know, almost out of money. I'd probably pick up the Panasonic 12-35, to because it's a very versatile lens at yeah. that point. And... I'm not 100... I guess I'd probably go with the NTG3 and how many? That's four items now. And the Zoom H4n and that I'd be out of money. Yeah. Okay, cool. That sounds like a good setup. I think I would uh, probably go with a Sony a7 III because that's a ridiculous uh, camera for the money, I think. Yeah. Because uh, you get full frame for 2,000 bucks. I think it's just mind-blowing. Yeah. Uh, and I would go with some native Sony lenses that are a little bit cheaper, not the G Master series, but the, you know, the basic Sony lenses. The problem and with I would that probably... is that the basic uh, Sony lenses are just so soft, which is why I was thinking a7 III when you first said it, but then I was thinking about lenses and... Hmm. I don't know. I think uh, the the 30 millimeter 2.0, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, that uh, looks very sharp to me, but maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Uh, anyways, I would go with the uh, Rode NTG4 Plus and uh, probably uh, Zoom H4n and uh, yeah, I would probably uh, try out the Ronin S because like I have a handheld gimbal, which I love, it's the Zion Crane 2, it's, it's, it's a great gimbal, I think, but... Uh, I really like handheld gimbals because they just give you such such freedom that uh, you, you will never experience with you know dual handle gimbals. But anyways, um, yeah, I think the Ronin S is an amazing piece of equipment. But also, gear lust is kind of annoying. Like uh -huh. uh, we we get caught up so much in the gear that sometimes we actually forget to create. So yeah, I get actually. It's just I'm, I'm planning on making a video on that soon because everyone's asking me, oh, I want to get a new camera. Oh, what camera should I get? That's like what everybody's asking, right? Yeah. So I want, I'm going to make a video about uh, when you should upgrade your new camera because, I mean, eventually you outgrow your current camera and you need the things that a new one would have, right? Yeah. And so I have this, this thing I always tell people where if you need a new camera, if they think they need a camera, I said, tell them, go look on YouTube. Search for the best short films, best videos made with your current camera, right? Yeah. And then once they found those, if they cannot recreate the quality, the image sharpness, the clarity, the lighting that's in that best video with that camera, then they're not ready for a new one yet, I think. Um, yeah, but at the same time, I'm I'm pretty sure that uh, camera bodies doesn't matter as much as lenses. Because yes. if you take a T3i, which is a pretty bad camera mm -hmm. uh, by today's standards, and if you put an L-series lens on it, it uh, will look much better than, let's say, uh, I don't know, a GH4 with a very sh shitty lens, uh, yeah. in my opinion. So Well, that's like why I tell them if, they're, if they can't make it that, then they don't need the new camera. I'm not telling them, that, I mean... They might need a lens, that yeah. could do it for them, but... Yeah, 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 you're right. Okay, so um, enough of the gear talk, let's talk about your um, uh, process of creating your YouTube videos and also your client videos, if you want to talk about that. Uh, how do you plan your shots and your whole video? What's, um, your, what's your process? I'm going to start with YouTube. For the okay. YouTube videos, I generally, I come up with the idea, I write out kind of like a bullet point list of the things I want to cover and talk about, and any like ideas I have for specific things I want to say. And then I'll email them over, open them up on the phone and put them in the teleprompter just so I have the like, literally the prompts. Which for a teleprompter I use this like, uh, I guess you can't see it from here. It's a cardboard box with a glass 45 degree angle. It doesn't exactly look pretty but it gets the job done. Then I'll set up my lights, which I kind of have set up so I can do it pretty easily. Set up the lights and the camera and the microphone. Record it all. And just while I'm talking I'll 
I'll be thinking the whole time of the b-roll shots I want like I'm even thinking about what would make good b-roll for this video even though I'm not gonna be filming any b-roll right now and I'll come up with the b-roll shots and I'll just grab them it's not I don't really plan those out for the YouTube videos so much mm -hmm. okay I see uh, cool and what's your process of actually editing those videos that you shoot hmm well it's a it's a little bit longer but I start by you know importing them in Premiere making sure they're all down to whatever frame rate I'm editing on, which is almost always 24 FPS. And then I just, I, I go from there, I put together the general storyline with, I don't use proxies just because my computer takes forever to render proxies. So I'll go from there, I'll put out the general storyline, then I'll go through and add the like, the jokes, if there's any jokes, the music to either emphasize those jokes or just, you know, give upbeat mood to the video. And the B-roll sequences I edit after that, I'll split it, slide this stuff to the side, and put in the B-roll sequences, which is generally for the YouTube videos, it's not very much. It's just slow motion and music. But if it's a travel yeah. video, it gets a lot more complicated, the editing. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, and um, the other thing that I want to ask you, uh, which is a bigger topic, is how do you do the SEO of your videos? Because I'm pretty sure that you are the best at SEO in this young uh, filmmaker community. So yeah, how do you do your SEO? Because I think it's super important, just like I said in the last episode, but you are the best at it, I think, uh, from us. So how do you do it? Um, Yeah, I, I have to say, I agree with you completely on it being very important. A lot of people just overlook it, but if you want views, which I, for if you know if you want views you want the feedback on your videos you need to be able to do it and I'm actually hired by two or three companies to do the SEO for their YouTube videos and the basic thing is you need you need to research your topic that you're gonna title it first so mm -hmm. you could make a video but then you need to come up with a title that people are gonna want to click on and there's a few things you need to know for your title one Google Keyword Planner is a very helpful tool for coming up with your titles you can always search any ideas you have in there it'll come up with ones that people are actually searching for so that's a great tool. You have to sign in with, I think, a Google AdWords account for that, but um, if you have a YouTube channel, you probably have an AdWords account anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go from there, you come up with your title, and for your title, you're gonna need a few things to make it clickable. You need, and I, I know it kinda sucks when people go all caps titles, but if you emphasize certain words, like the main keywords that you found from Google Keyword Planner, like for what's in my camera bag, I'll put camera bag in all caps, because uh, people always, that's something people would search for. And if you emphasize it, YouTube, at least I've found, ranks it higher for those keywords than having it just flat. I don't know why and if that's true, but it certainly seems like it to me. And once you choose your title, which again needs to be searchable, you then need to write your description. And this is the part that people overlook the most. The description is where the bulk of the SEO actually comes in. You need to put in your keywords a lot in the description. And you can't just do the you know, write the word comma, write another word comma, that thing that people do where they just put a ton of tags in the description. Mm -hmm. that, that's against YouTube's guidelines and it doesn't work. You have to write out, you know, decent amounts of things. Like if you look through my video, I'll put the title in several times. If you enjoyed this video, put the title, make sure to subscribe. Or if you have any questions about this video, put the title again. Because then you're getting the keywords because hopefully you put the main keywords you want in your title anyway. And the other thing is to make your title longer. A lot of people make their titles way too short. If you look at any of my videos, my titles are in general a little bit longer than most people's because that gives YouTube more to work with. But then you go through, you put those main keywords from your title in the description in all kinds of different ways. Like if you look at my most viewed video, my GoPro one, how to make GoPro footage cinematic, I'll cover all kinds of different things you do in the description, kind of give you a summary of the video because then you're giving YouTube more to work with so they know what your video is about, so they can rank it higher. Tags are um, something that are a little bit more easy to figure out, but they need to be longer. A lot of people just use their one word tags, but like if your title is how to make GoPro footage cinematic in 2018, you're gonna make GoPro cinematic, GoPro footage cinematic, how to make GoPro footage cinematic in 2018, how to make GoPro footage cinematic. Those will all be tags you'll use from that title. And you want, to, you want to generate at least 10 tags from your title because you're reaffirming to YouTube exactly what your video is about. And if you research your title well, then they're gonna know exactly what your video is about and they're gonna rank you high for that title that you researched. And um, once you have the 
once you put your keywords in, they need to be longer. I like to keep my keywords between one, which I'll do a few of like GoPro for and cinematic for how to make GoPro for cinematic. But I like to mm -hmm. keep my keywords at least four words because you're giving YouTube more detail to work with, you know? Yeah, I see. And there's that's that's very valuable information right there. So thank you for sharing that with us. I just have one more tip. I think that a lot of people won't cover either is if you script your videos, like I know a lot of people will script their videos because who wants to just sit here and talk to a camera for a long time, you're going to mess up a lot and feel really dumb, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if you script it, take that script and put it in captions for YouTube. Because if you give captions, YouTube's gonna rank you higher the, every time because they know exactly what your video is about because they have all the dialogue and everything that's in the video. And the more they know about your video, the higher they're gonna rank you because they know more about your video about this than they know about other people's videos about it. Hmm, interesting. Cool. That's that's very valuable, as just like I said. Like, I don't do like half of these uh, things that you just mentioned. And I feel like uh, those videos that are actually popular on my channel are not the ones that I did the SEO the best. Some so, will just take off. Like my yeah my S Samsung Galaxy S9 versus Panasonic G7. That video has like 24,000 views right now. And I didn't put any effort into the SEO. I figured no one was going to care. But apparently people cared about that video. Yeah, I was the same with my what's in my camera bag video. And that, that's at like... I know 5,000 views, uh, which is a lot for my channel. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's interesting and uh, yeah, cool. Uh, so my next, my next question is how do you write uh, your descriptions? Like uh, I know that you said uh, like what's the thought process of that, but do you have uh, any other information that you like to include there or cross promote your social media? And also uh, do you have like a strategy for your uh, thumbnails, because they are also like really important to catch the uh, people's attention. But uh, do you have yeah any strategies for that? Uh, I do. You actually, um, so for my description, like I said, I always put all that information. But I also have this section I always just copy and paste from each video, where it has like a link to my Instagram, my Twitter, to certain playlists. Because then you're you're also giving YouTube more about what your channel's about. Like I'll put filmmaking tutorials, travel films, like the playlist for each of those. Mm -hmm. But I'll also, and I put like little emoji before each one because they it looks, I don't know, it just looks better to me than just having a lot of text there, having emojis, symbols, stuff like that. And not like lots of emojis, that just looks weird. But like I'll put for travel films, I'll put a little globe or stuff like that. And I'll put in, so I'll put in my social media links, uh, a subscribe link too, because that actually gets a lot of clicks. I've gotten like 20 people in the last like month to subscribe from the subscribe link in my description because they can't wow. figure out how to push the big red button, I guess. That's weird. I didn't, didn't think of that. And I'll, cool. I'll also put a little tiny like description of my channel in the very bottom too. Just kind of, if people are still reading, I guess they'll subscribe. I don't know. Mm hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, and what are your tips for those who are uh, about to start YouTube in 2018? Do you have like any recommendations to do? Because like, if, for, and uh, it would be also helpful for me because I'm growing pretty slowly, certainly, but slowly. And uh, I'm not sure why uh, my channel isn't growing at a pace where it should be growing in my opinion not because i make i'm making like superb content but i think my content is decent enough and i'm uh, covering some topics that are not being covered uh, in a lot of videos so i'm not entirely sure why is my growth so slow so do you have any tips for me and also those who want to st uh, start growing faster yeah it does surprise me every time i look at your channel that you're not at several thousands i'm totally expecting you to pass me like every time i'm like next month vince <laughs> is gonna have more than me every time no i don't think so but because yeah, you're so your video quality is certainly there because that would be my first tip was you're not gonna grow until your video quality gets good enough that people actually care like if your videos suck no one's gonna care like my first videos I got like 60 subscribers over the first like four months because they were trash. But then I got up to a point where I'm growing by, you know, like 15 or 20 a day right now. Mm -hmm. And that's because, well, for one, I have several videos that are just exploding. But I also, my video quality got a lot better. So people are more likely to stick around because, you know, who wants to watch a bad video? Everyone wants to watch a good video. Yeah. But your video quality seems to already be there. 
So the other thing would be to choose, even if it's subjects that aren't, people aren't like covering, you have to choose and market it in a way that's something that people are already covering, kind of. So you want to do new things, right? But you also mm -hmm. want it to be put in like the suggested videos of videos that are sort of similar. Like suggested videos should be 50% of your traffic. So there, mm -hmm. there's two things you need to do for that. You need to have good thumbnails and you need to title it similar or keyword it similar to the videos around it. And that's where you're going to grow is from the suggested videos. If you're not mm -hmm. already growing from search results. I'm actually uh, checking it and my suggested videos are 34.5% of my watch time. There you go. Um, and my YouTube search is 21.2. Uh, so that's I don't not know, bad. that's not... Uh, not bad, but the, not too good either. Yeah, the, yeah, that sounds like you have a lot of just coming from just your subscribers. So encourage your subscribers, that means they're engaged at least, but encourage them to share it, promote it, you know, send it to friends who would be, they'd be interested in the same kind of video. Uh, I also want to ask you about how to get your first uh, paid client, because I know that you do a lot of client work um, and freelance stuff. So what's your uh, process of going from uh, working with zero people to working with several brands and uh, you know individual persons uh, for money? Uh, that's a really good question. A lot of people are going to be telling you this already. You have to work for free at first. And yes, I think that's true uh, to some degree. You're going to need to work for free at some point to get you know a body of work out. And um, a good way to do this is like if you have a local, if you go to a church, if you have any like a school even, do something for free for them because, and that they're going to be showing. If they're going to be showing it, there's a good chance a lot of people are going to see it. And I've actually, I did a video once, the first video I did was for my church. Uh, it was for free for my church and they showed it to somebody and I got like three different jobs just from that because the whole congregation is old <laughs> and they all own all the companies around here. Mm -hmm. So they all saw that there. But it's it's a lot of just word of mouth. You have to you have to go above and beyond whatever the client asks of you, and they're more way more likely to recommend you to other people. So it's word of mouth a lot of that's where a lot of my jobs come from now is from word of mouth. People recommending me to other local clients, or even other filmmakers. If the f other filmmakers around, if they're more experienced or whatever, they'll get job offers, but they'll be doing a different job or they'll be busy and they can't do it. And they'll start to pass it on to you. So networking with other filmmakers is big too. Now it's hard to actually get in contact with the local filmmakers, and they and they generally look down on you if you're younger because I mean, nobody wants to have work stealing from a 15 year old or a 16 year old, right? <laughs> yeah. So you you almost have to like show them up at first, because that's the thing is YouTube. This is kind of a different topic, but YouTube gives you a much better perspective on filmmakers. Like you picture everybody to be really good, right? Yeah. Just because you see so many good filmmakers on YouTube. But then you go and you see the normal local filmmaker. Yeah, it's they're ridiculous. They're not any good. They're like, they look, the, my first videos were around the quality of the average local filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So you almost have to show them up, show them, hey, I can actually compete with you. And you have to earn their respect somehow. Work for them, work with them in, on some project for free and earn their respect so they'll start recommending jobs for you too. Mm -hmm. I actually got a lot of jobs from my father. He's a digital strategist, which basically means he does all the like digital marketing strategy for big companies. Like he'll do the SEO for their websites, but he'll also do the ads. He'll run the ads. He'll optimize the blog so they get traffic. And so he works with a lot of companies. And, and as you know, Vince, um, video is a, like a very powerful marketing tool, right? So he'll start suggesting video to them or they'll be talking about video. And, you know, he knows me because I'm his son. He'll be like... <laughs> All right, well, I know this guy, he'll work for cheap and stuff. So I've gotten a lot of jobs that way too, which, I mean, that's a unique way to get them. But if yeah. you can get your foot in the door with any company, even offer a referral program, like I'll do a way where if they, ref like if they refer to me to a company, I get a job from them referring me to somebody, I'll offer them a discount on whatever I do for them next, something like that. It's a good way to get a little bit more traffic. Okay, so my next question is, would you rather shoot a film or act in a film? shoot a film every single time i hate acting mm -hmm. i'm really bad at it and i love being behind the camera so mm -hmm. but I, i'd rather i don't know if just direct the film count because i'm not like particular about being behind the camera i just like to direct the film <laughs> mm -hmm. okay cool so you would like to be a, a dp or an actual director i would like to be the actual director 
Oh. I do okay. enjoy doing the cinematography part of the kind of film. Like, I like the lighting and all that. But I prefer directing the entire film. Mm-hmm. Okay, so where can people find you, Silas? Uh, they can find me on YouTube, youtube.com slash Silas Willoughby. I make filmmaking tutorials, travel films, short films, editing tutorials, really everything in that kind of genre. I'm thinking about making photography tutorials, but I just, I'm not a, as big of a fan of photography as filmmaking. You can also find me on Instagram if you want to see my photography at the Silas Willoughby and Twitter at the Silas W. Okay, cool. Uh, the links will be in the description as well. So thank you so much for listening to today's episode and thank you Silas for joining. I upload videos on a regular basis, so, so make sure to subscribe and also subscribe to Silas's channel. And thank you for listening. Uh, we will see you in the next one. Bye.